I also want to make sure that we do plenty of justice to our next topic, which is the increasing sharpness that we've seen when it comes to political protest at Mayor Wu's house, before that at Governor Baker's house, also in some other uh, local areas. Tito Jackson, let me stay with you for a second. Um, we have seen the people opposed to Mayor Wu's vax mandates that are just now kicking in. We've seen them show up at City Hall and drown out the sound of her swearing in the new city council. We've seen them march through the streets of Boston, and now they are a regular presence at, as we and other news outlets have reported, at Mayor Wu's home in the morning, where they are very vocal, uh, upsetting her neighbors, uh, among other people. As someone who was on the city council, uh, mm -hmm. ran for mayor, what do you see when you size up the protests at Mayor Wu's home. Yeah, so um, I have been involved um, in multiple protests um, across the, the city of Boston. Um, I, when I worked for Governor Patrick, we do need to note um, that there were people from the Republican Party who protested um, in uh, prisoner outfits um, in front of his home, as well as the home of, of John Walsh. Um, and so this is something that has happened. Um, for me personally, um, I, I think it's out of bounds. Um, I think it's it's there's one thing to do it once, um, but I, I I personally think you know where she's going to be. She has a public schedule, um, so I, and and the uh, it, the enhanced issue of having uh, children involved, I believe, um, it is, uh, is is an issue. I, I absolutely understand uh, that there are people's lives that are being affected by uh, requirements relative to uh, COVID. I had COVID in March 2020, um, and uh, there are multiple uh, medical challenges that I had to go through um, at, at that time. Um, but when it comes down to it, um, in particular for those individuals who are in the public safety space, this is a critical uh, matter. Um, and what I would say is, and, and we do need to acknowledge this happened also to Mayor Walsh, um, there were individuals who, who did go yep. to his home. Um, but I think that what it's, that stands out here are, are the number of times this is happening, the consistency um, in, in what's just happening. People absolutely have a right um, to uh, have their First Amendment rights uh, heard. Um, I think there's a component of decorum um, as well as uh, the way in which we engage. I'm not saying that uh, they don't have a right to do it. Uh, but I think there are uh, other methodologies that could be used uh, in the long term and uh, in, in a sustainable manner that actually could uh, be a more effective than what's going on right I'm, now. I'm glad you brought up the Walsh example. As you note, it wasn't a daily thing, but we were going to show, and we may have them, some, some images of a protest at, at then Mayor Walsh's house in the summer of 2020. People showed up at about 6 in the morning. Uh, they chanted that he should defund the police, fund various other projects, talked about different causes, dispersed with no incidents. I think it was a one-off. I think it's that same group that a week or two later put report cards on the doors of different Boston city councilors, which some councilors took great issue to. Uh, Jennifer Nassar, I want to ask you about what could be done legally uh, when it comes to these protests. As Tito Jackson noted, they have a right to register their displeasure with Mayor Wu's policies. But Harvey Silverglate, who's a noted civil libertarian, is, is very hawkish when it comes to protecting freedom of speech. He told the Boston Globe columnist Joan Venaki recently, loud demonstrations early in the morning in a residential neighborhood do cross a line and the demonstrators are subject to arrest. The law on this is very clear with regard to any public demonstrations. Tactics are governed by what the Supreme Court has dubbed considerations of time, place, and manner. Again, Harvey Silverglade is a guy who knows his stuff. I want to ask you, if these protesters were to be arrested at Mayor Wu's home, what do you think the impact of those arrests might be? Well, so, you know, I mean, we see that this the governor has had protests at his home almost every day since the pandemic has started, right? Um, you know, and this is something, like Tito pointed out, you know, and it was, uh, you know, Deval Patrick, and it was John Walsh, and I, I, this has been going on for a while. It's very unfortunate. It is a First Amendment right. However, I would say it's really disruptive to the, you know, when you run for public office, it is you who puts yourself out there. It's not your family and it's not your neighbors and it's not your friends. And those people should be immune 
from those protests. And so, you know, it's almost like if your neighbor tears down their house and a new home is being built, there's a certain time period that that work can start. And maybe that's it, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what Harvey is saying is that, okay, so protests can't start until eight o'clock in the morning. Yeah, time, and place, and manner. Maybe no speakers, right? maybe no bullhorns. Exactly. Yeah. And so you're not really chilling free speech, but you're saying you have to uh, you have to abide by the same rules and regulations as other loud um, noises that we hear in a neighborhood. As far as any public place that you are, I mean, it's unfortunate that we've gotten to this place, but the the country and people have become so disrespectful that it's no longer just a peaceful protest. But I've been at events where the governor has been and people are blowing bullhorns. They are making so much noise that it's frustrating to be someone who is at a place it, so if they go to a restaurant and you basically stop their life and it's not fair because they are public servants and they should be treated with the same respect that you and I are. I feel like I should mention here, I have covered some of those protests at the governor's house and at one of them when some environmental activists put a boat in front of his driveway and chained themselves to the boat and said they were putting the governor under house arrest. I talked with one of the organizers and I said to her, well, what would you say to people who argue, you know, yeah, it's fine to, to protest, but don't do it this way. And her answer to me was, you know, we've tried to get coverage for the issues we are interested in. We've sent press releases out to GBH mm -hmm. and other news outlets. Um, you haven't covered us before, but here you are now talking with me. So maybe the media has a role to play here, too. Tito Jackson, uh, carrying through the point that, that Jennifer Nassar made about the, the tone in the country, Diana Ploss, one of the right-wing protesters who has been a regular at Governor Baker's home, she reportedly helped derail a recent Board of Health meeting in Somerville where they were considering vax mandates by bringing a bunch of people who were not from Somerville to disrupt the proceedings. Something similar happened in Beverly uh, right before the new year when people showed up and, and among other things, proposed that uh, they all head down to Boston and burn down Mayor Wu's home. Do you think that when we get back to life as we used to live it, when we're not interacting with each other virtually, but we're actually you know, doing, for example, a Board of Health meeting in person, is this stuff going to simmer down just because it's harder to be a jerk in person, or have we crossed a line here? Uh, you know, it's interesting, Adam. You, you know, I think a lot of the uh, tonality that you see from Twitter uh, and online is uh, kind of the, the things that you get uh, that uh, you see written on walls and bathrooms, right? Yeah. Where there's the, the cowardice um, that that you see. Um, but I, I do sadly uh, believe that we are in a really difficult place. Um, people are, are talking at each other and not to each other. Um, I think these issues, and, and by the way, a lot of these are underlying economic issues. When you listen to what people are saying, um, they're actually speaking about their economic health and, and well-being. So there's actually some topics that we can, we actually all agree upon, um, but we end up starting with what, where we disagree yeah. versus backing into um, where we actually start and, and agree upon um, a, across uh, the state as well as the country. One of the things though, Adam, is people have to engage on a local level. We shouldn't have 200 people from outside the city of Boston come and overrun a meeting um, that is about people in Boston. That is a challenge for those elected officials to continue to engage people, um, to make sure that people are, are engaged. It's a challenge for our government as a whole, and it's also a challenge to our communities uh, to make sure that we are not overrun uh, by uh, individuals who uh, may or may not live in, in and around yeah. uh, their, their uh, community. So I think there's a lot to be done um, in, in that re regard. We got um, part of a sorry yep. to sorry to interrupt you. I just know the clock mm -hmm. has ticked down, and I'm now mm -hmm. in the red. So we got to leave it there on a mildly optimistic note. Tito Jackson and Jennifer Nasur, thank you for talking this through. Thank you. Thank you.